Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters. Welcome to the study. Now, over the next hour and a half, we are going to get into some of the lead-in for us to be able to consider Zechariah chapter 4. It's interesting that this one chapter of 14 verses has so many spirit of prophecy admonitions. We're going to have a lot to consider. Some of what we're going to go through today are going to be from different documents that Mrs. White had written. Now, as you can see, the one that is before us right now states that portions of this manuscript were published in Faith I Live By or Heavenly Places, which are two devotionals. But this in full had not been presented. So, as we go through these documents, let us ask our Heavenly Father for His guidance, for His wisdom, and for our minds to be open so that we may more clearly understand that which we are going to need to understand from this book in Zechariah. Shall we pray? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for these hours of the Sabbath. We thank you for your guidance and for your direction. We thank you, Father, for all that you are doing for us. For we are sinners. We have not truly, in spirit and in truth, understood or kept your law or the covenant with which you have made with us. Please forgive us of our sins. Please direct us now, Father. As we open your word, we ask for your guidance. We need your wisdom. We need your spirit. We need your angels to attend us. We thank you for your promises. We ask now, Father, that you be with us. We accept the promise that you have made. Where more, two or more are gathered, there you will be also. That through this medium, at this time, that all who are gathered here may be blessed by your presence, may be guided by your spirit, that your will may be done, and that we will be prepared to give the message that you would have us to give. We thank you, Father, for the many answered prayers that you have provided. We thank you for hearing and answering this prayer today. For this, Father, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now. What does the second advent have to do with Zechariah chapter 4? Last week, as we studied, we were looking at Zechariah chapter 3. We were considering the vision of Joshua and the angel. Now, we are going to go forward. We're going to lay some groundwork for what we're going to be studying in Zechariah 4. Now, this document is a very short document. It's 10 paragraphs. But there's quite a bit in this that we're going to need to consider today. The people of God are to bear in mind that the great day of the Lord is at hand. The signs which Christ declared would be given just prior to his second appearing are now being fulfilled. Please note, she wrote this in 1899. 
Speaking of this time, the Savior said, As the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came, and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill. One shall be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready. For in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Matthew 24, 37 to 44. Of that day and that hour knoweth no man. No, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Take ye heed, watch and pray, for ye know not what time this is. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work and commandeth the porter to watch. Watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh, at even or at midnight or at cock crowing or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch, Mark. 1332 to 37. So uh, those different things, um, even, midnight, cock crowing, and morning, are those the four watches? I'm not sure. I would say they probably could be. Okay. I, I just know in the time of Christ, there were four watches. Prior to that, there used to be three. You know, in, in the early period. Exactly. Yeah. But so there's four of them mentioned. So maybe. Um, okay. So Rand says that's how he understood it. Okay. Christ gave this information, these cautions and warnings for us. So this wasn't given. For the disciples, this was given for us today. He has told us the signs which are to herald his second advent. And now he calls for faithful watchmen who will give their attention to the fast fulfilling prophecies and stand not in idle contemplation, but watching and waiting for the second appearing of Christ in the clouds of heaven. The events taking place in this world will be recognized by these faithful watchmen. They will not be found surprised and unready. The day and the hour of Christ's coming is unknown to the people of God. By lips that never make a mistake, it has been declared, of that day and hour knoweth no man. No, not the angels which are in heaven. For this reason, the solemn charge comes to each of us. Watch. Be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Matthew 24, 36, verses 42 and 44. Who then, Christ asks, is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household, to give them meat in due season? Who will be on the watch and tracing the signs of Christ's coming point by point? Give the right message to the people. Blessed is the servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verses 45 and 46. There is a great work to be done. And those who are doing God's service must not employ their time in preparing a variety of food for the table. They are not to be slaves in the kitchen. Christ exhorts all, take heed to yourselves, 
lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and the cares of this life, so that day comes upon you unawares. For as a snare it shall come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore and pray always, that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things which shall come to pass, and to stand before the Son of Man. Luke 21, 34 to 36. So, this little paragraph is interesting. Why would she be giving us an exhortation that we should not employ our time preparing a variety of foods for the table? Why would she be saying that we are not to be slaves in the kitchen? Well, people obviously were, and that's there's other work to do instead of satisfying appetite. Okay. In in the Gospels, who was noted as being that we could see as a slave in the kitchen? Well, you, you had Martha. Right. And where was her sister? She's at the feet of Christ. Is that not where we should be? Yes. Okay. The parable of the talents presents the most important truth, which all should understand. God has not distributed his talents capriciously. To every man are given abilities which will fit him for the work God calls him to do. There is to be no sleeping at the post of duty. Every soul is to understand that he has a work to do for God. So that means that only the ministers, only the conference workers have work to do for God, right? Is that the way the work has been apportioned? Or is the work for all of us to do? Now, we are told, study carefully the fourth chapter of Zechariah and learn what the two olive trees there referred to mean. Read it carefully, verse by verse, for in this chapter, the features of the work in which we are engaged are plainly set forth. What does that mean to you? What does this mean? I'm not sure what it means other than we need to study it and understand the two olive trees and we have to do a careful study verse by verse. Right. So this, this chapter features the work in which we are engaged. So, so we need to understand it. So this would be the work that we are doing. Okay. And the angel that talked with me came again and waked me as a man that is waked out of his sleep and said unto me, what seest thou? And I said, I have looked and behold a candlestick all of gold and a bowl on top of it. And his seven lamps thereon and seven pipes to the seven lamps which are upon the top thereof, and two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl, and one upon the left side thereof. So I answered and spake to the angel that talked with me, saying, What are these, my lord? <clears throat> then the angel that talked with me answered and said unto me, 
knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Our power and efficiency are not in ourselves. We receive them from a higher source. Then answered I and said unto him, What are these two olive trees on the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? And I answered again and said unto him, What be these two olive branches, which through the, go the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? And he answered me and said, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then said he, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Now, it's interesting, verses 7 to 10 are not being mentioned. And, of course, 7 and 10, symbolically, we would be able to use as being the 10th day of the 7th month. Then I turned and lifted up mine eyes and looked. And behold, a flying roll. And he said unto me, What seest thou? And I answered, I see a flying roll. The length thereof is twenty cubits, and the breadth thereof is ten cubits. And he said unto me, This is the curse that goeth forth over the face of the whole earth. For every one that stealeth shall be cut off, as on this side according to it. And every one that sweareth shall be cut off on that side according to it. I will bring it forth, saith the Lord of hosts, and it shall enter into the house of the thief and into the house of him that sweareth falsely by my name. And it shall remain in the midst of the house and shall consume it with the timber thereof and the stones thereof. Zechariah 5, 1 to 4. The events that are taking place on earth are critically watched in heaven. For by them, human beings are being tested and proved. Every individual soul, if he would receive the seal of the living God, must hear the word of the Lord and do it with exactitude. Now, what would we, how would we apply that statement? How would we address this? What would you think? This is a an admonition given to every person. <clears throat> and Every person has the opportunity to receive the seal of the living God. But if we're going to receive, we must also hear. We are to do this exactly as the word implies. There must be no such thing as haphazard religion if men would have a place in the family of God, all who are brought into connection with God will be pure and holy. They will receive the holy oil from the heavenly messengers and will impart it to their fellow men. Okay, so, um, so if we break down this, so the events that are taking place on earth are being watched in heaven, right? So right. they're, they're noting all of these events. We could say that these are the events that are on our line. Right. And we're being tested and proved by those events. Right. This chronology. Right. So 
if we are to receive the seal of God, we must hear the word of the Lord and hear it with exactitude, right? Right. Okay. So that means, you know, what we're doing, which is very precise um, analysis of the times, that's, I think, what she's describing here. Okay. So, so we can't do this in a haphazard way. Now, when I think about, um, you know, what haphazard is, um, you know, you could use willy nilly, right? You got How about all these sloppy? Different yeah, sloppy, right? It's just people are not taking the time. We are not taking the time to be precise about what we're studying. We're, we're doing a lot of guesswork, speculation, and, and we can't do that. How did Father Miller study to come to his understandings? Well, he did through comparing scripture with scripture in, in a diligent fashion. So this receiving of the holy oil from the heavenly mess, heavenly messengers that she's talking about here, what she's asking us to do, what she's saying that we must do is we must study God's word, just as she describes how we need to study um, Zechariah chapter four. I mean, we need to study everything that way, right? We have to carefully look line by line, verse by verse, not pass things you know, unnoticed. Right. Everything. Um, now, this is, of course, a rebuke to us because, you know, we have been, you know, sloppy right. to a large degree. And, and yet people expect that, you know, this is asking too much. Right. To, to do what we're doing, people would say it's just too much. So, the, you know, the question, I guess, one question would be, you know, why is God asking us to do this with exactitude? Why are we to hear the word of the Lord with exactitude? And why only those that do so will receive the holy oil from the heavenly messengers? That is, they're going to receive an understanding of truth that they then will be able to impart to their fellow men. Right. And that's what we've been studying is that we need to be able to present a message and we've we've been studying in a way that we hadn't ever studied before. Right. Right. So we've been much more detailed. Um, every little every little detail, whether it's the number of a Hebrew name or symbols within numbers or dates and comparing scripture with scripture. And yet still there's a lot of work to be done. Because we don't have a message yet that we can impart. We're still in the studying process. There's a lot that's before us right now. Mm -hmm. As we see this. And I'm going to repeat these two lines. <clears throat> All who are brought into connection with God will be pure and holy. They will receive the holy oil from the heavenly messengers and will impart it to their fellow men. Now, we're going to have multiple things that we're going to be learning about the impartation of this heavenly oil. There are so many references with that were written during the time of Mrs. White's life about this one chapter that it's rather it, it, it's intriguing to see how many different ways she presented this, bringing all of them together for us to study is quite a task. But we're going to have a lot of these that may be some duplications, but we're going to have a lot of others that we're going to be looking at. 
that we're going to need to consider that we're going to have to think about and look to apply with everything else that we've been studying. The talents entrusted to men are not to be employed to please and glorify self, but to honor him from whom those talents come. <laughs> or as the song would say, from him from whom all blessings flow. And as these gifts of God are appreciated and valued and used, they will increase. So the gifts that God has provided to us, one, are to be appreciated. Second, they are to be valued. And they are to be used. For when those three steps occur, these talents, these gifts will increase. So these four steps are very important for us to consider. The fullness of Christ awaits every receiver. <clears throat> Those that will choose to receive of Christ. will receive blessings of our own selves we are poor but if we come to christ and ask him in faith we shall receive eternal riches christ stands waiting for us to ask him for the gift of the holy spirit i may say you will receive but my word is not enough you must take the words of christ and understand his willingness to bless and strengthen and give to you the fullness of his riches. The more precious treasures of grace are discovered and drawn upon, the more anxious will we be for all to enjoy these heavenly riches. According to our capacity for understanding and appreciating these great gifts of God will be our ability to communicate to enlighten the minds of those who are in the darkness of error. We are to draw from the inexhaustible source and gladden hungry, starving souls by presenting to them the living bread which comes down from heaven. Every man should consider himself of value with God because he has been entrusted with the richest gift that can be obtained. The soul is thrilled with the love of Christ as it drinks deep from the inexhaustible fountain. This is the will of God concerning you, even your sanctification. 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 3. We have looked in the past that our steps have been justification, sanctification, judgment, and glorification. So, here again, she touches on sanctification. What does it mean for us to become sanctified? Are we not learning more and more of what Christ would have us to do? What are your thoughts? We're definitely learning more and more. So as we're learning more and more, are we not symbolically standing in the holy place? Are we not before the throne, before the candlesticks? And are we not before the altar of incense? Okay, so, so the idea here then is as we study, 
as we do this work that's being put before us. We are doing a work in the heavenly sanctuary symbolically. Right. Although our sins may be as a mountain before us, if we humble our hearts and confess our sins, trusting in the merits of a crucified and risen Savior, he will forgive and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. As the soul yearns after God, he will find more and still more of the unsearchable riches of his grace. The salvation of one soul <clears throat> reveals the depths of a Savior's matchless love. If all church members who have known the truth would accept this salvation, they would bear the testimony, we have redemption through his blood. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us and gave himself for us. Believing in him, we rejoice with joy and unspeakable, with joy unspeakable, and that is full of glory. Now, we have four verses or four sets of verses presented before us. I would like your assistance. I need four people to read these four sets of verses. Okay, Ephesians 1, verse 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Okay, now who can read Romans 8, 2 to 4, and 8, 37? Romans 8, 2 to 4. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And verse 37 Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Who can read Titus 2.14? Yes, Titus 2.14. It yes. reads, Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, and purify unto himself a peculiar people, serious of good works. Okay, and then finally, 1 Peter 1, 8. I can read that. It says, um, whom having not seen, ye love, in whom though ye now see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. In each of these, we are given the representation how the law, our schoolmaster, <clears throat> helps us to understand what Christ is not just willing, but is able to do in our lives. This should be the expression of every soul whose name is on the church books. But many are not in communication with God. Therefore, they cannot give life to the church. It is the privilege of every soul to be a living channel through which God can communicate the treasures of his grace, the unsearchable riches of Christ. When God's people occupy this position, Light will shine forth to the world, and blessed experiences will be made known. Confession of Christ will be made, which will reveal that hearts are burning under the reception of the holy oil that comes from the two olive trees. Okay. 
consider this as we go forward. It is here, right here in this world, that our talents are to be used in helping the souls that need help. Those who desire to be led by the Lamb of God. It is not enough that we ourselves enjoy the riches of God's grace. We are to lead others to the fountain of living waters. We are to point souls to the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is the work which God designs shall come first. And when Christ shall come, he will gather the redeemed from every nation, from every kindred, every tongue, and every people, and lead them himself to the fountains of living waters. The talents of, that God has given carry with them an accountability. Consider this. We are accountable unto God for the talents that we have been given that have been bestowed upon us. It is the work and should be the pleasure of everyone who believes in Christ to present to the world in his own life the unsearchable riches he finds in his Savior. We may make daily progress in the upward path to holiness, and yet we find still greater heights to be reached but every stretch of the spiritual muscles, every taxation of heart and brain brings to light the abundance of the supply of grace essential for us as we advance. <clears throat> the more we contemplate these riches, the more we will come into possession of them, and the more we shall reveal the merits of Christ's sacrifice, the protection of his righteousness his inexpressible love, <clears throat> the fullness of his wisdom, and his power to present us before the Father without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. The words of the Apostle Paul to Timothy, take heed to thyself and to the doctrine, may be addressed to every member of the church. 1 Timothy 4.16. The golden oil is pure, unadulterated truth in doctrine and in practice. <clears throat> Received, believed, and practiced, this truth forms character that will prepare us to do the great work to be done in this life and will give us a fitness for the service we shall render to God in eternity. Again, the apostle exhorts, Wherefore, my beloved, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Do all things <laughs> without murmurings and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life. Philippians 2, 12 to 16. As many received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. And of his fullness, we all received and grace for grace. John 1, 12 to 14 and 16. Man can do nothing of himself. He cannot advance or retard the work. <clears throat> Does this not mean that we cannot, of our own power, make the work go forward, and we cannot, of our own power, <clears throat> slow down the work? 
The work must be done through the power of the Spirit of God. The Spirit's grace is imparted to the church to be given to the world. Zerubbabel could not understand this mystery. And as a little child, he confessed his ignorance. He longed to understand, and he placed himself where he could understand. Then the word of the Lord came to him, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Zechariah 4, 6. Zerubbabel. The meaning of the name is what? Well, it means, um, you know, a, a sprout uh, from Babylon or from Babel. Okay. Right. So it can mean out of Babylon. Right. So that is something that has come from Babylon. So in other words, is this also not something that is brought out of confusion? Well, yes, though in in this context, this is the second angel's message. This is the call out of Babylon. Do we have a confusion in the message that we are to give? No. The work is the Lord's, and man must be his faithful instrument. <clears throat> if he will cease to look at appearances and trust in the living God, he will have all the help he needs. He is to go forward in faith. Man's weakness is no obstacle in this work, for God can perfect his strength out of weaknesses. He can save by many, or he can save by few. This is a representation of the work of truth. <clears throat> Zerubbabel is represented as the chief authority in directing the work. Man is to do his appointed work. But he must move forward in faith, for a lack of faith will leave his work incomplete. Mountains of difficulties will be removed, and the work will be completed but it must be acknowledged as holy of grace. We are living amid the perils of the last days. That period of time is no longer in the future. It is right upon us. There is need of men who will not fail to be discouraged. There must be no negligence now. Every attention must be given to the spiritual necessities of men and women, lest the day of God shall overtake them as a thief. <clears throat> we must be diligent in using the talents entrusted to us, that we may give back to God his own with usury. All are to be workers. On every soul rests the most solemn responsibility to use his opportunities and privileges for the glory of God. Dwight, I just wanted to cut in here because you said, if I heard you correctly, there is need of men who will not fail to be discouraged. And I went, what? <laughs> and then I read, there is need of men who will not fail nor be discouraged. Right. So we're talking, <clears throat> talking about this sentence right here. Yeah. So are we to take heart? Are we to understand that even when things are looking their darkest, we are to continue to look to Christ? Amen. Amen. It's a daily battle. Now, this document, <clears throat> only parts of this document were ever published. 
before 1915, or excuse me, before 2015. How much does this document represent to us today our great need to look to Christ in every situation, in every challenge that is placed before us? Is this word uh, our word? Sorry, I believe that God's word is for every person and every situation. And that's what we need to keep reminding ourselves of. Nevertheless, in spite of everything that's happening here, the Lord knows our situation, our need of him, whatever we're going through. And he cares about it, no matter how petty and silly it seems, you know, no matter how minor it seems. He cares about every facet of us, which is marvelous. He's such a wonderful father. Agreed. Okay, now from the chat, we are presented with Isaiah 42, 4 to 6. Why? What do you see here that is important for us to consider at this time? Because it mentions that Christ also, he... It says he will not fail and he would not be discouraged. So regardless of what he encountered on earth while being here, his mission and his will was to do the will of the Father. So the obstacles before him was not his main focus. If he kept his eye on his Father, he would succeed. And so too, he left that example for us. That if we keep our eyes on him, the sins and the things that so easily beset us will be victorious over them also. On October 23, 1844, were the Millerites discouraged? Yep. Yet what did they do? Um, well, they kept looking for the truth. Did they not return to studying to understand what had gone on? Yep. Is this not what we have been doing over these last many months? Yeah, definitely. Examining the foundation and even other more series of studies that we've been going through. Exactly. At this time, we have many things that we need to be considering. Now, all the way through this, we are to look and we are to study. And what is the admonition that we are given about these studies? Are we not to delve deeply into scripture, into what is presented by Mrs. White as a miner looking for gold and jewels? Are we not told that we need to delve deeply to consider carefully everything that we find, that we are to look and continue to look in these rich veins for that which God would have us to understand? Right. Now... <clears throat> See if I can bring this next document up.
So, all right, here's screen. Okay, is this is this now shared revelations of judgment? Yeah, I can see that. <clears throat> okay. To what end has man been endowed by God with superior gifts? That he may magnify the Lord God of Israel. A lawyer came to Christ with the question. Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? <clears throat> and he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he has said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. Luke 10, 25, 27, and 28. In his teaching, Christ presented to man a noble and vastly important work. <clears throat> so, in this answer to the lawyer, Christ is presenting our duty. In the day when everyone shall be rewarded according to his work has been. How will transgressors appear in their own sight? As for a few moments, they are permitted to see the record of their life as they have chosen to make it, regardless of the law, which through the eternal ages will govern the universe. They will then see what God desired them to do they will realize that they should have used their blood-bought privileges in behalf of truth and righteousness. They will see that instead of placing their talents and influence on the side of rebellion, thus strengthening the forces of the enemy, they should have devoted their powers to being and doing good. That's quite a comment. Do we wish to stand to see what we could have done? Or do we wish to understand what we are to do today? Christ gave his life to redeem transgressors, to save men from Satan's power, to enable them by obedience to vindicate the immutability of the law of Jehovah. What does it mean for something to be immutable? It means it cannot be muted. It can't, can't be, be go can't ahead. Be, can't be divided. And it can't be made all, silent. Yeah, it can't be changed. Yet, what do we see through this world? We have many that are saying that God's law has been changed. We have many that are addressing that, oh, well, God didn't really mean that. We need to understand his law, his covenant with us so that we can then stand as examples referencing how the law can make the person, man or woman, to be able to stand for that law. He designed them to declare by lives of consecrated service 
that the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. He died to make it possible for them to be partakers of the divine nature. To them, he gave the privilege of being sons and daughters of God, joint heirs with Christ to an immortal inheritance. He pledged himself to conform the nature of fallen man to the laws and authority of the kingdom of God. When in faith and love man submits to him, he will fill his heart with his divine life. He will make him one with himself so that the thoughts and aims will be identical with the thoughts and aims of the Savior. The man will be born again, not of flesh, but of the Spirit, and to obey will be to carry out his own will. What does this last sentence say to you? The work of conversion is a work which Christ alone can do. Do we agree or disagree with this, this statement? I agree. Why? I thought it was the, the Holy Spirit's job to convict us of sin. Why is the work of conversion a work which Christ alone can do? To me, as I know that we don't have power um, within ourselves, like to to convert, like from unrighteousness to righteousness. That's according to me. I don't know if there is anybody having other more thoughts about it. When we come to the cross, when we are at the foot of the cross, when we see what sin has cost our Heavenly Father, when we see what sin has cost Christ, Do we not begin to understand the not only the eternal implication, but the the very message that God's law cannot change? will not change and that only one could pay the price for that which we have done. We were not in Eden, yet we are just as guilty as Adam. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Again, this work of conversion is a work which Christ alone can do. Other sheep I have, he said, which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. John ten sixteen. In the day of judgment, men will see what they might have become through the power of Christ. Do we want to deal on what might have been, or are we going to deal on what we are? They will see the robbery that they have practiced toward God. They will realize that they have apostatized from their creator. They will see the good they might have done, but they did not do. They utterly refused to be made better. 
Are we going to refuse that which we can become? The efforts put forth in their behalf, <clears throat> the efforts put forth in their behalf were in vain. They knew the claims of God, but they refused to comply with the conditions laid down in his word. By their own choice, they were united with demons. What does this say to you? Is this not a warning for us? The power given them to use in God's service, they used in the service of self. They made self their God, refusing to submit to any other control. They deceived themselves and made themselves contemptible in the sight of God. Is that where you wish to be standing today? As they worked on the side of the power of darkness, <clears throat> they encouraged others to do the same. They arrayed themselves, soul, body, and spirit on the side of the enemy, laying as a willing offering on the altar of Satan that which they should have given to God. At whose altar are we worshiping today? Although there was among themselves jealousy, envy, and discord, yet they were linked together as with iron bands in opposition to the laws which bring peace and harmony to the world. Fallen men and fallen angels are sure to join in desperate companionship. He who fell because of apostasy works constantly against goodness and obedience. He is leagued with those who refuse to keep God's law. Are we to enter into league or covenant with the apostate? With whom are we to be leagued? With whom are we to be in a covenant? In the day of judgment, all this opens up before the impenitent. Scene after scene passes before them. As plainly as in the light of the noonday sun, they all see what they might have been had they cooperated with God instead of opposing him. The picture cannot be changed. Their cases are forever decided. They must perish with the one whose ways and works they followed. A flash of light will come to all lost souls. They will see clearly the mystery of godliness, which during their lifetime they despised and they hated. And the fallen angels, endowed with higher intelligence than man, will realize that they have done in using their powers to lead human beings to choose deception and falsehood. All who have united with the deceiver, all who have learned his ways and practiced his deceptions must perish with him, and here in brackets, because they have the seeds of rebellion in them and have worked in their own way, carrying out their own devisings. Companies are formed in this world to strengthen Satan's methods 
to destroy the influence of God's appointed agencies. Where these should have been almost innumerable multitudes that expect to be saved, they have joined the rebel leader and would, if they only had a chance, carry on the work they began in this world to mold minds to their ideas. The Lord Jesus looks pityingly upon them and says, depart. At that time, Zechariah chapters 3 and 4 will be understood. Now, we are going to be, in the next weeks, entering further into the study of Zechariah chapter 4. We completed Zechariah chapter 3 last week. There are many things that Mrs. White would have us to understand. There are many things that God presents that we need to understand. And yes, in the chat, that this, all of this is very much a warning. And yes, these are awful words. But are they not words of warning that we need today? Is this not the admonitions that we need to listen to? That we need to take in so that we are warned. God is giving a warning to us. He's giving us examples. He's giving us the opportunity to turn from our paths to his path. Now, okay. I'm going to open one other document and we will begin with this. There's no way we're going to be able to get through this today but we're going to begin with it. Okay, is this, is this next document now up before you? Mm -hmm. Do we have, we have a new document? Yeah. Okay. When those who are poor embrace the truth and do the very best of their ability, our Heavenly Father will see when they have gone to the extent of their ability and he will bring in other talents in order to carry forward his work. There is a wonderful work to be done for the master yet, and we want to act like living soldiers at the cross of Christ. Some things were presented to me in a dream, September 29th, 1886, which I wish here to read. Now, it should be noted that September 29th, 1886 was the 29th day of the sixth month of the biblical year, 5931. If this was the 29th day of the sixth month, what would follow that day? If we're, if we're placing things on a biblical calendar, what would we find would follow the 29th day of the sixth month? The first day of the seventh month. Why is that August, important? Right? Why why is that important for us? It was the day for the trumpet, the feast of trumpet. 
It is the beginning of the Feast of Trumpets. Why is it important that we understand the Feast of Trumpets? It was a recall for the entire Israel to to gather up for for the atonement that was that was coming in a few days. Right. Ten days to come. Exactly. So if we are to be aware that this warning is given prior to the beginning of the Feast of Trumpets, this is a warning for us so that we may more clearly be prepared, so that we may be ready for the end of the Day of Atonement. Now, as she writes, in a dream given me September 29th, 1886, I was walking with a large company who were looking for berries. There were many young men and women in the company who were to help in gathering the fruit. We seemed to be in a city, for there was very little vacant ground. But around the city, there were open fields, beautiful groves, and cultivated gardens. A large wagon laden with provisions for our company went before us. Soon the wagon halted, and the party scattered in every direction to look for fruit. All around the wagon were both high and low bushes, bearing large, beautiful whortleberries. But the company were all looking too far away to see them. I began to gather the fruit nearby but very carefully for fear of picking the green berries, which were so mingled with the ripe fruit that I could only pick one or two berries from a cluster. Some of the nice large berries had fallen to the ground and were half consumed by worms and insects. Oh, thought I, if this field had only been entered before, all this precious fruit might have been saved. But it is too late now. I will, however, pick these from the ground and see if there's any good in them. Even if the whole berry is spoiled, I can at least show the brethren what they might have found if they had not been too late. Just then, two or three of the party came sauntering around where I was. They were chatting and seemed to be much occupied with each other's company. Seeing me, they said, we have looked everywhere and we can find no fruit. They looked with astonishment at the quantity that I had. I said, there are more to be gathered from these bushes. They began picking, but soon stopped saying, it's not fair for us to pick here. You found this spot. The fruit is yours. But I replied, that makes no difference. Gather whatever you can find anything. This is God's field, and these are his berries. It is your privilege to pick them. But soon I seemed to be alone again. Every little while I heard talking and laughing at the wagon. I called out to those who were there. What are you doing? They answered, we could not find any berries. But as we were tired and hungry, we thought we would come to the wagon and take a lunch. After we have rested a while, we will go out again. But, I said, you have brought nothing in as yet. You are eating up all our supplies without giving us any more. I cannot eat now. There is too much fruit to be picked. You did not find it because you did not look closely enough. It does not hang on the outside of the bushes. You must search for it. <clears throat> True, you cannot pick it by handfuls, but by looking carefully among the green berries, you will find very choice fruit. Now, as we're going through this, what imagery comes into your minds? What are you seeing 
from these representations. Well, I'm seeing so many times on Sabbath, for example, in church, there would be more uh, picnicking as in potlocking and idle chatter than tr trying to use that time to reach souls and then going home and napping with most people. I mean, I was thankful for the times that we did have some outreach or we did go to somebody's place and further study scripture. But on most of the time, it was just a waste. Okay. I like, brother, Me. brother, um, do I, I like yeah. it. I'm sorry. I like that. I like that last quote where it says, where it says, it does not hang on the outside of the bush. You must search for it. True. You cannot pick it by handful, but by looking cl cl close, looking carefully among the green berries, you will find very choice fruit. That reminds me of the um, searching the Bible. You have to you have to search it deep, search it deep enough to see the fruit. Right. Now, a comment in the chat. In Western North America, the common names huckleberry, bilberry, portalberry, and blueberry are largely interchangeable. That's interesting to me because a huckleberry has a very different taste than a blueberry. I don't know that I've ever encountered a bilberry. But the rest of the comment is, it's not unusual for a single plant to be called by two or more of these names. Yet, here is a plant. Here is a fruit-bearing plant. One of the things that we enjoy at the camp meeting that we had <clears throat> up in Leduc was to have a, a, a fruit pie called a Saskatoon. Now, I'd never heard of a Saskatoon before. When we went for a walk on Sabbath, Theodore showed us the a tree that a Saskatoon could be taken from. Now, I've, I've been out to find blueberries. A blueberry is a lot different from a Saskatoon, yet a Saskatoon is very blue in color. But Brother William, you're right. Here we are given this. We are given this opportunity to find God's fruit. And what fruit is he really referring to? Is this not the fruit that grows from the seed of the gospel that is being scattered? This fruit does not hang outside in easy view or in easy reach. You must search for it. You cannot pick it easily. You have to take what is ripe, and leave the other green fruit yet to ripen. But when we are picking this ripe fruit, we find it is very choice. Mrs. White continues, My small pail was soon full of berries, and I took them to the wagon. Said I, this is the nicest fruit I've ever picked. And I gathered it nearby while you have wearied yourselves by searching at a distance without success. Then all came to see my fruit. They said, these are high bush berries, firm and good. We did not think we could find anything on the high bushes. So we hunted for low bush berries only 
and found but few of these. What else comes to mind when someone is calling, come and see? To come and see Christ. Um, with the high bush, I'm thinking that could be the, the higher classes. And right now I'm sharing with a, with a guy who makes really good films and encouraging him and we're sharing back and forth. So if you could pray for him, he's the fellow who made the uh, series, the, the, the Sacred Plant. And he said in one of his last emails, I'm of the same mind that you are. So I think he's receiving a lot of what I'm saying, you know how I'm depending on Christ for my healing and so forth. But okay. these people, because they're involved in that kind of work, they have a lot of temptations. So if you could lift them up in prayer. Okay. Where else, though, do we find Come and See? William Miller. William Miller's dream? Yes. The way he called the people like to come and see the, the, the jewelry box that I had found. And then when they came in, they just dispersed them around the roof, the whole room. But are we not at a time where that casket is now larger and the jewels and coins are being assembled in the casket? But there's one other from Scripture. What happened with the Samaritan woman when she began to understand what was going on, what Christ was offering to her? What did she do? Did she not return to her city and tell others, come and see? Right. Here we have a choice. Here we have an example. They all came to see my fruit. They all came to see the fruit that others thought was not available. Those that looked that looked upon this came back and said, these are high bush berries. They weren't looking for high bush berries. They were looking for the low hanging fruit. You, you, also, you also got that come and see in um, Revelation 6. Okay. Share that with us, please. Where in the first verse it says, I saw then and lamb opened one of the seals and i heard as it were the noise of thunder and one of the four beasts said come and see and then yes. in verse and then in verse three and verse five has the same come and see in verse seven okay that's a great point. Thank you. Then I said, will you take care of these berries, then go up with me to look for more fruit on the high bushes? But they had made no preparation to care for the fruit. There were dishes and sacks in abundance, but they had been used, they had been used to hold food. I became tired of waiting and finally asked, did you not come to gather fruit? Then why are you not prepared to take care of it? What are we seeing in this example of the gathering of the fruit and the question that is then asked? Why are you not prepared to take care of it?
are we not in these situations to be prepared to gather in the Lord's harvest, to gather in his fruit, to gather in his wheat, to his glory? But are we not to be prepared to take care of that fruit that we bring in? Are we not to be prepared to help these souls that are brought into this message to grow? Now, because of the length of this document, <clears throat> We will return to finish this this next week. Do we have any other thoughts at this point? Okay. Comment from the chat. Sometimes the souls are homeless and dirty, and we need not pass them by. Here again, are we not given the example of a man that wishes to give a banquet for his son? He invites his friends. And what do the friends have to say? Oh, I have just married a wife. I've just bought a piece of property. I've done this. I've done this. And they choose not to come. And what then becomes the admonition that is given? Go ye into the highways and byways. Yet we have one that, that comes to this banquet without the clothes that are being provided. And what happens to that party? That is an that is a hard thought to have to, to work with. God does not desire that any should be lost. Through these messages, he would desire that all can be saved. The question that we have to ask ourselves are we willing to do the work that God would have us to do? Are we going to be prepared to take care of the fruit that comes as it is gathered? Shall we then close this session with prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for these words of warning. We thank you for the blessings that you are providing. We ask, Father, for your guidance through the rest of the hours of this Sabbath. Help us to consider that which you have provided for our edification. Direct us now. Help us to understand more fully that which you would have us to do. May your will be done. May your character and your name be glorified in all that you would have us to do today. For this, Father, we thank you. For this, we praise you. Now and always, in Jesus' name, amen.